It is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Jackie Taylor, who is hosting our special guests today. I have known Jackie all of my career, and she's currently one of my colleagues. She also is the first female president of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, a role which she still holds today. Um, without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Jackie to introduce our special guests. Thanks. Over to you, Jackie. Hello, I'm Professor Jackie Taylor. I'm President of the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Glasgow, and it's my honour to be the first female president in its 420 plus year history. I'm also a consultant geriatrician in GRI, and I've been proud to work here for 24 years. I'm delighted to be part of Friends of GRI's Women's Week. It's been fascinating over the course of the week to hear about some of the amazing women who've worked in GRI or been associated with it. They've worked in different specialties in a variety of disciplines and roles in different eras. But what binds us all together is the huge affection that we have for this hospital. I was a University of Glasgow medical student and we were divided into two main teaching groups, the Western and the Royal. I, of course, was a Royal student and once a Royal girl, always a Royal girl. It was in the wards here that I learned the basics of history taking and clinical examination, feeling fairly terrified of many great teachers who taught with equal measures of enthusiasm and humour, often at our expense. I returned to GRI as a senior registrar, spending six months in rheumatology. In 1989, when I returned, there were no medicine for the elderly beds in GRI at all. The Ferguson Anderson unit not having opened until 1993. And there were only two female consultant physicians at that time. Dr. Hilary Capel, who was a great role model and who I had the good fortune to work with, and Dr. Marjorie Allison, the well-known nephrologist. So there have been many, many changes, even in my lifetime. And gender balance has certainly improved over the last 30 years. Today, we're going to hear from a number of my female contemporaries in Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Dr. Ruth McKee, an incredibly skilled colorectal surgeon with an interest in parenteral feeding. Rosie Cherry, who's head of facilities at a time when hardly any women were working in that area. Hazel McNaughton, charge nurse in the emergency department for many years, and she will certainly have seen life there and she's currently the Interim Clinical Services Manager for ECMS. And Sally Hughes, well known to you as Lead Nurse for Medicine, who on retiring decided to take on another big role in the Louisa Jordan Hospital. They are a group of very inspiring role models. I'm really looking forward to hearing them share some of their stories, and I have no doubt that there will be plenty of laughs. So what is the essence of GRI? It is, of course, all about the people, the staff and the patients, who are without doubt a breed apart. The Royal Infirmary has real heart, which just grabs you. It gives us all a sense of belonging, a pride, a commitment, and I know we will always be prepared to go that extra mile. This hospital provides care for some of the most vulnerable patients in some of the areas of highest deprivation in the country. We've all seen the data on widening health inequalities. We see it in practice every day. So the work we do here really matters and is valued. Let's remember that. It's been a great privilege to spend the majority of my consultant life here in Glasgow Royal Infirmary. I would like to say a heartfelt thank you to all of my colleagues for their support, particularly over these last three years of my presidency. I have been incredibly fortunate. So now, let's hear some of those interesting vignettes. Hello. I've always been very proud to be able to say that I worked at Glasgow Royal Infirmary. Even as a child growing up in the country in the south of Lanarkshire, if you were really sick, you went to the Royal. And I had a cousin who was very proud to be able to say that she trained in nursing at the Royal Infirmary. So I first actually worked here, having been a Western Infirmary medical student, 
uh, when I was a senior house officer. That followed on a bit of a debacle when I first applied for the West of Scotland surgical rotation. When the interview started by an elderly male from one of the district general hospitals giving me quite a long lecture on how difficult it would be to do surgery when I was a woman and didn't ask a question at the end. So that was pretty difficult to follow up and I didn't get the job. I worked at Stob Hill for a year and then uh, David Carter had felt sorry for me, I think, at that first interview with 12 elderly males and me. Um, and the next year I got the plum attachment in his unit at the Royal Infirmary. So I did most of my training in Glasgow, a bit of a trip up north as a senior registrar and worked in London at St Mark's uh, briefly just before I became a consultant. So I came here as a consultant surgeon in 1993 and I think that that means that I was the first female consultant in general surgery, at least as far as I've been able to find out. There was a lady urologist called Helen Wingate, who strangely is listed as an associate specialist at the Royal Infirmary, but a consultant at Redlands, and that was in 1945. And I've heard rumours that there was a female orthopaedic surgeon sometime between the wars. So lots has changed since then. When I started at the Royal Infirmary, General surgery was divided between the old surgical block and the academic unit, which was in the new Queen Elizabeth building. And uh, nowadays, we're all in the Queen Elizabeth building in a really quite convenient location for all our inpatients, where emergencies are on the top floor, uh, elective general surgery on the second floor, high dependent, sorry, on the third floor, high dependency on the second floor, ITU below there, and outpatient endoscopy and theatre are all further down in the same block. So that works pretty well. And the other thing to say is that things have changed dramatically, even post-COVID, in terms of waiting time. When I joined the Royal Infirmary, Ian Finlay was the only colorectal surgeon and his waiting list for benign disease was four years. So even after COVID, you can cheer yourself up that hopefully it's not as long as that. General surgery has also changed dramatically over the years. Uh, in 1993, Claire Emery, who was worldwide famous in pancreatic surgery, was also, also taking on a lot of inflammatory bowel disease and even did some breast cancers. Vascular surgery had a separate unit and that's a long-standing thing at the Royal Infirmary. But everything else was together in general surgery. Since then, breast surgery has separated off and not many breast surgeons are on the on-call rota nowadays. And even gastrointestinal surgery has divided itself into three different specialties, at least. Lastly, one of the most dramatic changes that's happened in the past 20, 30 years is that now we have lots of women in surgery. And I'm glad to say that at the Royal Infirmary at the moment, we have female surgeons in all of the main gastrointestinal specialties. So there's Carol Craig in esophageal gastric, Maria Coates in the pancreatic surgery team, and Martha Quinn and Fiona Leach in the colorectal team. We think that's a bit of an improvement, and I hope you do too. Thanks. Hi, my name is Rosie Cherry, and I first started work in Glasgow Royal Infirmary in 1990 for a company called Sodexo, who had won the catering contract. Unfortunately, coming from the, 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 the very fragrant West End, I didn't know where the Royal Infirmary was. I'd never been beyond the end of Suggy Hall Street in my life, so I had to get directions to the place. When I arrived for my interview, having only worked in restaurant kitchens during university, the mammoth kitchen that the Royal Infirmary had at that time was a total culture shock. 
However, I managed to get over my shock and started working in the Royal Infirmary. I also, during that time, was lucky enough to be able to go to the old kitchen on the sixth floor of the centre block, which still produced some meals for the dining rooms in the old Royal. And unfortunately, one day I went up onto the roof, as you could at that time, from the lift outside the kitchen. I hadn't realised, of course, that you couldn't call the lift from the roof, and I had to knock on the skylight to get back down. The roof itself was going to become a bit of a feature in my time at GRI, because I also, during a later period working there, uh, was in charge of arranging for when the flag was flown from the flagpole. A number of people felt the need to write to me anonymously to complain that we should be flying the saltire from the Royal Infirmary and not the Union flag on the occasions that we had to fly that flag. We had to fly the Union flag when the Commonwealth Games ceremony finished and there was a special commemorative service at Glasgow Cathedral to um, commemorate the start of the First World War. And yet again, I was up on the roof arranging the flag with the states and also showing the police where they could overlook Cathedral Square from. The square was all shut off at that point in time, so nobody could access to get near the cathedral, but we were lucky enough to be able to nip out a back door into Vickers Alley and have a look at David Cameron and Prince Charles from, from quite a close vantage point. Prince Charles also visited again after the Clutha disaster and came to speak to staff, including porters, about their experiences on the day. So another interesting thing that happened during my time at the Royal Infirmary happened in 2005. My then boss called me down to his office and swore me to secrecy and told me that we were to be visited by the American Secret Service. I was slightly confused why the American Secret Service would want to come to the Royal Infirmary, but it turned out it was in advance of the G8 summit that was to be held at Glen Eagles that year. And although we were not the first receiving hospital, the American Secret Service wanted to come and see the GRI facilities. I had imagined that Secret Service agents would be rather more glamorous. However, sadly, the Secret Service agents didn't quite live up to my expectations of what I thought they would be. Um, it, they turned out to be two rather short gentlemen who, after a tour of the facilities, gave us both a very nice commemorative badge. And rather fortunately, we never had to receive George Bush or Laura on during that time at the G8 summit. Also during my time, during the early part of my career with Sodexo, we used to have to cater for the Nurses League uh, afternoon tea every year and these were a number of former nurses trained at GRI, some of whom were quite elderly by that time. On one particular occasion they decided to dress up in vintage uniforms. I'm assuming they were from about the 60s because they were terribly short and the caps that they wore with them were particularly unattractive. We also had to arrange every year to go to the matron's flat and collect the special crockery, the cake stands that the afternoon tea for the nurses league would be served on. Throughout all my time at GRI, I've met some really wonderful people and done some interesting things, but it really is the people that make GRI, and it's always been one of the most special places to work in Glasgow. Uh, hi, it's been an absolute privilege to be asked to do um, something like this um, for the Friends of GRI. I think um, my career has started uh, here in the Royal Infirmary. Um, my mum before me, um, interestingly, um, she was worked here and then she was a fever nurse in, in Rock Hill. So maybe it's just always been in my blood, although I did actually want to be a PE teacher. Um, however, um, I started my training many years ago as a psychiatric nurse, um, and that was based at Gatlock Hospital with the Eastern College of Nursing. Um, I worked there for quite some time and actually it was the beginning of the modular system um, and we used to do uh, 13 week modules, we were one of the first groups to do that and our very first ward, my very first ward was actually ward 2 here and it was a sister, a uh, sister Jackie Wright, and I think actually Jackie may still be here. I think she went on to do palliative care, but I have to say I think Jackie was certainly my my inspiration from the word go. Um, I remember the very first per person that ever died, and just going with a uh, sister Wright at that time, and understanding the compassion and the empathy, and you know the way she handled everything. And I hope that in my career. I have certainly um, learned and I have done that with every every patient, um, not only in life but in death and I've taught that to other to other people as I have gone through my career. Um, that was a real 
um, inspiration, I would say, that word. And it was actually interesting to hear that actually um, Sister Wright went on to, to work in palliative care. Um, however, I took a totally different um, <coughs> view and actually ended up going, I finished my training at Gartlock and, and went on to then work in Duke Street Hospital as a staff nurse and then went on to do my conversion training, um, whereby I ended up in the Royal. Um, my initial... Um, uh, where, where, my, where I wished to be was actually a surgical unit. Uh, I, that was my, wanted to be my first post, and that's what I was interviewed for. And back then, there was actually no, believe it or not, there was no vacancies there. So I ended up in the emergency department. Um, and again, I have great, great memories of the old building. They call it the gatehouse now. Um, it, well, the gatehouse then, and it's still the gatehouse. And actually, funnily enough, we've, we've gone a big 360 move, and we now are back in the gatehouse, having started there. We now have minor injuries back there. And again, we have to mention COVID through this, but that is actually just through COVID footfall, etc. We now have the minor injuries down there. So I think uh, some of our very, my best days, I have to say, some of the funniest days, some of the saddest days, um, some of the craziest days were in that department. I think, you know, a few people I do have to mention was certainly Mr Swan, who was our consultant. Um, he, um, there was only, I think, two consultants. One of my colleagues will be coming on hopefully after me and she will tell you a wee bit more and better memories around who, who was his predecessor. But when I started, it was Mr Simpson, who was a, a hand surgeon at the time, but also did um, a, a emergency medicine or, or trauma or casualty, as it was then, um, and Mr Swan. And Mr Swan, actually, he was very pivotal in the whole of, of Glasgow, essentially, for his work in head injuries. I think, um, you know, I have great and fond memories of him. And, you know, to this day, I still keep in contact with him, even though he's retired. Um, he, has, he was inspirational in lots of ways with head injuries. Um, but also, I think, you know, he always used to carry a bar of soap, um, if I remember correctly, in his um, white coat pocket, you know, when he did his ward rounds for the head injuries and he would get them all to have a wee sniff at the soap to see if they did know me or not. Um, the other thing which I do remember Mr Swan about was actually no matter what came in and what emergency came in in the famous room nine, and no matter who was in these rooms, you had Mr Swan just saying, could you just set me up for a cut down, please? And a cut down was always, um, you always did that usually on the leg, at the ankle, and it was a, a special sort of set where you could actually hook up a vein and then just put a line into the vein. Now, obviously, we, have, we didn't have ultrasound scanning then, uh, and when you look back, things have changed so much. You know, We didn't even have a CT scanner, if I remember correctly, way back. And if somebody was going for a CT scan, you took them over to the Southern General, you know, in an ambulance. And it was, when you look back, it's, you know, we've come on so far. Um, imaging now is just absolute, you know, pivotal to just about everything we do now. Um, so looking back then, it's quite different. I think, again, my memories of starting out as an emergency, you know, nurse, as a staff nurse, is, you know, how we have come on so far. Um, we've come on because of preventative medicine. You know, you think of cardio, you know, cardiac medicine and uh, respiratory medicine and all the preventions that we've now got in place. We just do not see the amount of things like MIs and LVFs and really sick individuals coming in because of actually what we're now doing to prevent these people coming in. And again, you know, I was thinking about things like standbys coming in, the emergency calls we used to get in. It used to be a, like a great big crazy phone on a wall that was like a, a dinner school bell that rang out and you lifted it. And it was just a case of you were getting a cardiac arrest in or a road traffic accident. But actually now we get so much more detail and actually, you know, we, we get their observations and we get, you know, what they're like just now. And actually sometimes we don't even get them because they go directly to the Jubilee Hospital now. So things have improved <clears throat> massively in, in terms of um, prevention and what we now get in, in, into emergency medicine. I think um, other, other huge areas I think I have seen is, is, is around violence. Um, I mean, unfortunately, we have, you know, just recently we have, you know, we had quite an incident there just on Saturday, which, you know, again, I would say is quite unusual. We don't have that same amount of violence uh, any longer. I think there was lots of work done way back probably in the 80s um, and early 90s with um, 
the, the, the violence reduction unit and you know we worked really hard with them and our own medics we went into schools there was a lot of prevention I think a lot of laws have changed and and a real focus on violence um, and I think one story which I will actually mention many years ago and again my colleague Hilda will, will definitely remember this and it was a letter that we got on a Monday morning from a GP um, which basically really said um, Dear doctor or casualty officer or whoever, um, you know, Mr. Smith has come up this morning and he has got a, an obvious, obviously got a broken wrist and uh, he was actually up in your department on Saturday night and it wasn't the fact that there was a huge queue or it wasn't the fact there was a woman half naked running about the waiting room but it just all became too much for him when the man sitting next to him got stabbed and the man left. Clearly. So, you know, the, the man had left. And again, when you look at some of the incidents that we had back then, it was, you know, it, it's very different now. It's a very different uh, model we work with, although it is still there. It absolutely is still there. So I think, you know, when again, looking back, things like uniforms have changed. You know, when I started, it was all the white dresses. And then when I got my first sister's post, it was a nice blue uniform. And I always remember getting given my first frilly cap, and I was so proud of it. Um, and I've still got that cap, but I've got no starch because I was actually going to bring it in, but I had no starch to starch it. <laughs> so um, I've not brought it. And then we went into some a bit of a crazy outfit which looked like a shell suit and it was meant to be like water resistant and it had long sleeves and it was just a big blue suit um, and it had, it had the GRI emblem on it and then we've obviously moved on we went on into scrubs after that and that wasn't deemed ideal and now we're in the national uniform so looking back um, there's been an array of uniforms but the one thing I do remember is, is certainly well it's now sister well, sister Morrison who has since retired but she used to be sister Smith and sister Curry when I started they always wore their navy and they had the lovely ruffle cuffs which was a great memory and and you just always think the Royal Infirmary when you when you see that well I do um, so lots of really amazing things have happened over the years um, I think the other thing which I will actually say on this was I did actually meet my, my husband there um, 30 years ago, oh, 30 years ago this year, <laughs> maybe you better cut that bit out, <laughs> but I think it's, it's been a real, it's been a real, my, my life has been very much um, involved in the Royal and both personally and obviously um, my whole career really has worked around it. I've been away and done also different things, but I think um, I think my own two boys just know that I'm near enough married to the place as well as my own uh, husband. But at the end of the day, it has been my great pleasure to work here and I am still honoured to be here and be part of the Royal Infirmary. Thank you. Hi, my name's Sally Hughes um, and Latterly, I was a lead nurse um, here at Glasgow Royal Infirmary within the Medical Directorate. Um, I started my nurse training here in Glasgow Royal Infirmary in August 1976, um, a class of around 60 people. Um, and I still quite clearly remember my first day, um, quite dauntingly, walking through the GRI um, to the colonnade and into the nursing home um, to meet up um, with all of these new um, colleagues um, and uh, met um, a friend that day who's um, been one of my friends for the past 45 years um, still um, and we're still very close um, and that's a lovely memory that I keep with me. Um, I remember as well our first day receiving our uniform, white dress, white shoes, had to be American tan tights. Um, we had a blue cardigan and a black cloak. Um, and it reminded me of Nurse Nancy in The Twinkle, which was one of my favourite comics when I was a wee girl, um, but I was now a real nurse. Um, I spent three years training um, through Glasgow Royal Infirmary, Duke Street Hospital, Lightburn, Belvedere, Cannesburn, Gartlock, Lennox Castle Hospitals, um, Rotten Row and the Eastern District um, with the district nurses. So wide and varied um, training um, that we had, which stood us in very good stead um, for the rest of our, our careers, um, in mine especially. So um, I then 
uh, when I finished um, and became a staff nurse, uh, worked in Ward 9 um, within the medical area here. Um, initially planned to be there for two years um, and 23 years later I left. Um, I was a, a ward sister um, there um, which latterly became ward managers um, and uh, I had a, a great time um, in Ward 9. I loved it. Um, I worked with many interesting um, and characterful uh, nurses and doctors. Um, the, again at that time the, the doctors had their pristine white coats, shirts and ties. Um, everyone was um, immaculately dressed. They weren't allowed into the ward if um, they, uh, their coats were, were dirty. Um, so we had very high standards um, in that uh, respect. Um, and I maintained that with nurses and medical staff um, throughout the years um, working in the wards. Um, things are a bit more casual um, nowadays. Um, I also remember um, quite vividly uh, when we no longer required to wear our uh, nursing caps um, and um, that was a terrible uh, bereavement for me um, because I loved wearing my hat. Um, so I had many, many um, years uh, learning new things, um, developing new things. Um, some of the medical staff I worked with um, were very uh, forward um, thinking and forerunners um, and new developments and treatments and investigations um, and I clearly remember at times um, doing Blue Peter, um, working with tubes and elastoplasts and whatnot to try and find some way of developing a new sort of um, treatment or, or test um, to organise um, somebody's care. Um, and latterly, these things were then developed by um, teams who then got processing and, and such like. So th it was great fun um, being part of that. Um, within nursing, loads and loads of changes um, over the, the years. Um, within the ward, um, within that 20 odd years, um, nurse training changed three times. Um, so we had to relearn um, the different practices, um, the different ways that we would be educating students um, from when we learned, when I was a student, uh, we learned from each other. There were very few trained nurses um, in the wards when I was a student. Um, we um, helped each other. Um, senior students ran the wards and, and just now um, the thought of that is terrifying. Um, but we were in charge of wards um, on day shift and night shift, um, supported by maybe two or three staff nurses and, and the ward sister. Um, so we had to learn on, on our feet. Um, and, and it stood us very well um, for, for future. Um, also, working within um, the wards, the, the junior doctors at that time, and I know everybody thinks they're very hard work now, um, but junior doctors at that time, when they worked in the wards, uh, worked for two months. They had a two-month stint in the ward, and during that two months, they never had a day off. They worked every single day in that two months. On a Saturday and a Sunday, they might get an afternoon off unless they were on call. Um, and they were on call probably two nights a week while they were still working during the day. Um, so they, they had a tough gig, um, but uh, at least we got to go home to our own beds at night, but most of the time they had to stay um, here uh, on site um, and be ruled with a rod of iron by the consultants as well. Nursing's changed um, lots, um, very much of it um, for the, the better. Um, there's many more developments and, and initiatives and uh, improvements in practice. Um, we, When I first started nursing as well, when you had a, a heart attack and a, an infarct, you, you were in your bed for seven days um, and you were only allowed out on day four for half an hour to sit. Um, and it was timed um, to the, the moment. Um, and then uh, you were in hospital for 14 days, um, all told. Um, nowadays, they're out within five days, if not less. Um, and uh, it's it makes me feel old, um, but um, at the same time, uh, it's it's great um, to be able to see those developments. Also, um, IT um, and uh, electronics, never heard of. We learned by blackboard and, and book. Um, we had n no internet, no nothing, whereas now, um, from the early 2000s, um, when I then became a, a lead nurse um, or clinical nurse manager, as was at that time, um, it we started becoming a bit more electronically minded, which sh scared me um, quite considerably um, at that particular point because I'm not uh, tremendously IT literate, um, though I have, I have improved over the, the years. Uh, the ward managers had to learn all of these new skills uh, and nowadays everything's electronic. Um, there's very uh, little that we don't communicate with 
um, on paper, everything's uh, through email, um, internet, um, or such like. I've had a tremendous 45 years, um, and the thought of that as well um, scares me to think I've been here in and around the Royal Infirmary for, for more than 45 years. Um, I've had a great time. Um, I've had great memories. Uh, one especially so of the, uh, the very recently uh, retired chief nurse here, John Stewart, um, who was a first ward student um, with me. Um, and we had a problem one morning um, with the, the toilets um, and was reported duly to uh, the plumbing department, um, somebody en route. Um, the next minute he comes down to tell me um, that uh, it's all right, Big Wally sorted it. Um, what do you mean Willie sorted it? Now Willie was the other student um, who used to be a plumber um, and uh, Willie repaired uh, my toilet which was very kind of him um, but I had to explain to the, uh, the plumbers um, without uh, getting any union involvement um, that there wasn't an issue anymore um, within, my, uh, within my toilet area um, so he would get me in trouble um, on many occasions that man. Um, I also have a, a vivid memory of an elderly lady in the ward across from me um, who was quite immobile but managed to climb um, out of the window um, in the doctor's room um, and onto the windowsill and me with two colleagues I think they might have pushed me to the windowsill but me sitting in the windowsill um, trying to support her and encourage her to come back in uh, the window um, as I was being photographed um, by Chinese tourists um, within Cathedral Square um, at the same time there was a uh, sirens of fire engines coming up the high street um, in support of our incident um, but thankfully it all ended well um, and the lady um, came in safely um, and uh, afterwards um, was probably none the wiser um, of everything that had, had gone on. So I've had great memories and it's been a pleasure and a privilege for me to, to be part of the GRI um, over um, these last years um, and I have no doubt that it will continue to be um, a forerunner um, and uh, a fabulous place for people to, to work and learn um, and support patient care um, and treatments um, over the coming years. Thank you.